Hey Julio, how's it going? I prefer the game. Okay, so today's discussion is, is about a little more geometry. And we're gonna start with convex hulls. It's, it's actually a very well studied area. There are lots of many, there are many, many algorithms for, for computing the convex hull. And it turns out figuring out even which is the best algorithm is not that easy. It depends on the on the input. It depends on situation. So let's let's get started. So first, let's make sure our definitions, our understanding of of what a convex hull is clear. Um, so let's start with some definitions. First of all, we need to understand what a convex region is. A convex region is any region where if we take any two points in that region and we join it by a straight line, that entire straight line must stay in that region, okay? So here's a simple example. Um, one of these is convex and the other is not. If you, uh, this guy here, the red one is a, is a convex region, uh, whereas this one is not. And the reason is pretty obvious. I can find two points such that if I join the points by a straight line, that entire straight line segment doesn't stay within the region. It falls outside the region. And if that can happen for some pair of points, then the region is not convex, okay? So any kind of star shape is not convex. Whereas this here is a convex region because you can take any pair of points anywhere you want. You can join them by a straight line. It'll all stay within the within the region, fine? Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, that's the simplest definition. There are, there are other definitions as well, but for now we'll, we'll leave it at, at this. Now in a convex hull, you are, you're typically your input is a set of points and you want to know what is the smallest convex region that can enclose all those points. That's the convex hull, okay? Uh, again, over there, there are multiple definitions. I don't know if I have all the definitions here. So this is the simplest definition that says 
Uh, let me get out of this. Yeah, this is the simplest definition that says that for a given set of points, it's the smallest region. Now, what does smallest mean? Anyone? Minimum area. Minimum area. Minimum perimeter. So it seems like many definitions are possible. You have uh, some other definition? No, minimum perimeter. You prefer minimum perimeter? Uh, well, it turns out that it's definitely minimum area. Is it minimum perimeter? I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to think about this. Uh, uh, but it is, it is definitely minimum area. It might be perimeter as well. Yeah, yeah I think it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it has to enclose all the, all the points, right? So for instance, if I gave you a collection of points that are given here, some are black and some are red. This red polygon is the convex hull of these points. Uh, there are uh, uh, another definition is as follows. If you have a set of points, you can hammer some nails into e at each of these points. Then you can take a big rubber band and put it around the point around the nails and just release it. Whatever shape it takes, that's the convex hull. Okay. Um, uh, there are, um, uh, another way to do this is to, is to take a straight line and, and bring it close uh, until you hit at least two points from the set. If you take all the, all such line segments, they form the convex hull. Okay. Or there's another definition that says uh, if you take any line segment of the convex hull and if you extend it to infinity, then all the points stay on one side. Is that clear? Right? So these are all equivalent definitions, uh, but there are, these are all various ways to define the convex hull. So convex hull uh, with the last definition, the convex hull is the intersection of a bunch of half planes. Uh, this is called a half plane. If I, take a, the, if I take this entire plane and if I join these two lines and, and extend it to infinity, what I get is a half plane because I get two, uh, I get two half planes, one on the right side and one on the left side. And one of those half planes must include all the points. So if I take every pair of points where I have, a, I have one of its half planes containing all the other points, the convex hull is the intersection of all those, all those half planes. Okay, that's another geometric way of thinking about it. Okay, so you take, you take this half plane that gives you that, you take that half plane that gives you that, you take that half plane that gives you that, and you take the intersection of all those guys, that's your convex hull. That's another equivalent definition. So lots and lots of definitions, and all of them are, are equivalent, and, and it works out. Uh, it helps us to understand this better. Um, yeah, this is the rubber band analogy. You take your set of points, take a large rubber band, pull it outside the set of points, and then release it, and it should, it should collapse and, and sit on the points. Yeah. If you are using the rubber band example, yeah. a goal of the rubber band is to always minimize its length, right? Yeah, so, so perimeter should be true, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, that is correct, yeah. It just took me a while to make sure that, that that's true, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, there is one small concept that's useful, and we need to make sure we understand this. Uh, this is called the tangent to polygons. Uh, it's not quite relevant to convex hull, but you'll see that it's, uh, it's, it's somewhat connected. Let's say here is a polygon. Okay. If, I, if I gave you another point that's outside the polygon, then I can draw two common tangents to the polygon. Uh, what is a tangent? A tangent is, is, uh, is something that goes through that point, 
but touches this guy, this polygon in only one point. Okay, well it could touch on, a, on an edge, uh, which is okay, um, but it doesn't touch the interior of the polygon. Okay, it touches the polygon, but not, not in the interior. That's called a tangent. And if you take any point outside the polygon, you should get two tangents for any, any given polygon. All right, good with this? Uh, yeah, in, in general, if you have two polygons, you get many common tangents. So you can get a common tangent that's outside and then you can get common tangents that are inside. Uh, um, this is assuming that your two polygons, A and B, in this case, uh, it's, they use omega and, and what is this symbol? Um, lambda, right? Is that lambda? Yeah. Okay. Lambda. Okay. So lambda and sigma. Uh, if you have two polygons that don't intersect, then you will get four different tangents that you can draw. These turn out to be useful uh, because it helps to, to generate many, many different algorithms for, for the convex hull. So now we are ready to understand, uh, to look at various algorithms for convex hull. The, these two images here help us to get two obvious algorithms. Any thoughts on how this picture might help you to to generate an algorithm for convex hull? We take one point and lay the line the tangent and then Calculate whether it's uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. Well, clockwise. I want you to think of the big picture first. Let's say I give you 100 points. How do you build a convex hull and use the idea of tangents? Uh, the tangent will give you a point, will, be, will give you two points on the convex? On, on what? I, I don't even on have the convex. convex, I don't have the convex hull. I want to build a convex hull, right? All I have are a set of points. So, how do I build the convex hull? We can take one point, then we can take one more point. Okay, good. From one point we draw a line. Yeah, point, right. So this is called the incremental approach, right? Uh, in fact, you should start with three points because three points always pretty much, uh, unless they are collinear, form a triangle. That's the simplest polygon you can get, right? And then you can take the fourth point. If it's inside the triangle, forget it. If it's outside the triangle, what do I do? How do I add it? How do I add it? Yeah? Uh, you just move like, if it's the BI. You add the tangents as a Hold on, hold on, hold on. So you move the you know, point to the BI instead of that point. Sorry? You find the, so I have a triangle here or, a, or some polygon and I have an extra point. What do I do? You move your, your tangent points to any point. Move tangent points. I can't move tangent points. They are either given or not given. Uh, what do you mean by move? I'm not sure I understand what you're saying, man. Okay, let's, let's hear him out. Uh, the new point, you build tangents from that point to the triangle. And, and then? And then the, ta the tangents become the new sides. Correct. So, if, if I already have this polygon, if I want to add that extra point, now my new convex polygon is going to have the two pieces of the co common, of the, co of the tangents, and then the rest of the of the polygon. This is going to be my new, all of this is going to be my new convex hull. So I've essentially added this new point. Is that clear? 
So my simple incremental algorithm is, for every new point, if it's inside, ignore it. If it's outside, draw the two common tangents, and then merge it with the, uh, with the existing convex hull. Wherever the two common tangents meet, take the part that's outside and the two common tangents, that's my new convex hull, which includes the new points. So this gives me a simple convex hull algorithm. The, uh, one of the problems is that uh, implementing this efficiently is, is, is somewhat non-trivial. Well, if you know how to compute tangents, you can do this easily, right? And in fact, you can compute the tangents in about log n time, and the whole thing runs in n log n time. So this is a pretty good algorithm, okay? Fine. Uh, this picture also can give you a, a convex hull algorithm. Why is that? Hi. What strategy does it exploit? Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. So both convex holes and then use the tangents combined. That's right. Does that make sense? So chop up the set of points into two halves, compute the convex hull on both sides, and then you draw the common tangents, the outside guys, right? And now my new convex hull is going to be part of this polygon part of this polygon and the two common tangents. Does that make sense? So let me see if I can annotate this and draw it. Oh, where is my annotation? Oh, I don't have an annotation in this and I have to have zoom for that. <laughs> uh, oh, what is this? Okay. So in this case, this is going to be my convex hull, right? It's going to be all of this, and then this, and then this, right? Sorry for my bad picture. Over here, it's going to have this side of the polygon. It's going to have this side of the polygon, and then the two common tangents. That clear? Does T L L and T R R do they serve a purpose? Here they don't. Um, uh, there are other problems where they become useful. Okay. By the way, how do you know that these two polygons don't intersect? They have two tangents. Sorry. If they intersect, they have only two tangents in common. If, if they, they intersect, if they, they touch each other, then you have three. No. My question is, uh, do they intersect or can they intersect? Or are you sure they won't intersect? Or are you sure they will intersect? Um, we can be sure they don't intersect if you sort by x coordinate. Correct. So if you, if you chop them using a vertical line into two halves, then you can be sure that they won't intersect. Right? Is that clear? So in that case, it's going to look like that. And so the common tangents are not relevant. If they do intersect, you can still find a convex hull, but it's a little, little trickier. Okay. All right. So how do I erase this thing now? I have no idea. Sorry. Well, this is not Zoom. Oh. Oh, oh, there, eraser. I have to erase it, erase all links, okay, erase all links, okay, good. Okay, oh, but this pen still stays, okay. Did that go away? Yeah, okay. All right, so, so both these give you two simple convex hull algorithms. This one gives you an incremental algorithm where you start with three points, build a triangle, that's your simplest convex hull, 
and then you can add one point at a time using, using the ideas of the common tangent. Or you could use that picture there and do divide and conquer where you take your set of points, break it into two halves, recursively build the two convex hulls, and then add the two common tangents to form the larger convex hull, right? So these are all simple ideas for building convex hull. This is what people used when, when, when things started. But then somebody came up with this other idea called Graham scan, which is quite interesting. Graham scan works as follows. You start with a point that's, that has the lowest y coordinate. The point with the lowest y coordinate must lie on the convex hull. And this can be proved mathematically uh, by using the definitions of convex hull. Uh, and then, hi. hi. And then you join this point to every other point. Okay, that'll give you simple line segments. And then you sort those line segments based on the angle they subtend with the on the x-axis, all right? So once again, you take the point with the lowest y-coordinate, connect it to everything else. That'll give you n minus one line segments. Sort the line segments by the angle they, they form with the x-axis. And, and, and then we'll, we have to do some work, yeah. Uh, no, uh, uh, so far all I've done is, is first find the one m value with the y smallest y coordinate, that's order n, right? I only look at the y coordinates, pick the smallest. Then I connect it to all the others. Th those are constant uh, uh, amount of work. Uh, 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 if you add it over all of them, it's big O of n work. And then I sort them, which is big O of n log n. So all of this is still is still n log n, right? I still don't have the convex hull. I have all the points, but I have them in sorted order. Now what I'm going to do is to uh, uh, I can be sure that the first and the last edges are definitely on the convex hull. Why is that? Good, yeah. So it goes by the simple principle that if I take this line segment and extend it to infinity, it forms a half plane that has all the points. The moment you find such a line, uh, uh, such a line segment, you know that it's part of the convex, convex hull, always. Okay, same thing over here. I can take this line segment, extend it to infinity, one side of the line segment has all the other points, and so therefore it must be on the convex hull. Very simple principle, right? So therefore these two guys are certainly on the convex hull. Now what I'm gonna do is, this is the first and this is the last in terms of the angle, right? I am going to traverse them in that order and decide which of the points are going to stay on the convex hull and which ones are not. Now here's, this, here's the brilliant way uh, this man, uh, Graham, figured it out. The way he did this was, he said, uh, he's, he starts with this and <coughs> goes from one to two. <coughs> Let's say we call this point number one. Let's say we call this point number two. Let's say we call that point number three. Now, if in going from one to two to three, if you do a left turn, I'm gonna keep it, okay? Well, the first time around, it's obvious it is going to be a left turn. Nothing surprising about that. So I'm gonna keep that. Then he goes two, three, four, and checks if it's a left turn. And two, three, four is a left turn, so he's gonna keep that also. Then he does three, four, five, and this time it's a right turn. 
so you get rid of 4. So now he's going to connect 3 with 5, which means 4 is gone. 4 is in the interior of the convex hull, right? Now he does 3, 5, 6, because 4 is not there anymore. Well, essentially, he uses a stack. And the top three items on the stack are, are what he's going to, going to, uh, going to look at. So, so the stack will start with 1, 2, and 3. And 1, 2, and 3 will form a left turn, because we know that 1, 2 is the least angle. And so therefore, this one is obvious. Then he adds 4 and checks this and everything is fine. Then when he added 5, he looks at 3, 4, 5, the top three things, and checks whether 3, 4, 5 is a left turn. It was not, because 3, 4, 5 went that way. So out goes 4. Now the top three things are 5, 3, and 2. So you check that. We've got 2, 3, 5. And that's still a left turn, so no problem. Then we add 6 to it. When we add 6 to it, we have 6, 5, 3. So that's 3, 5, and 6. That's a right turn. So out goes 5. Right? Then we are going to, so we're, we're connecting 3 and 6. Actually, we don't need to check 6, 3, and 2. It turns out it'll work out. Uh, I'm going to continue here. After 6 comes 7. So 7 is that one. I'm sorry it's not numbered. Uh, so what do we have? We have 7, 6, and 3. So 3 is here, 6 is there, 7 is there, 3, 6, 7. That's a left turn, right? So we're going to keep that. Then we add 8. That's this guy here. And this time we're going to look at 6, 7, 8. And we are, we're fine with that so far, because that also looks like a left turn, right? Are you with me so far? All good? Then comes 9, and we've got 7, 8, 9. And 7 will eat 9, and that, there it goes. Right? Now, that was 9, so we add 10. And we've got 7, 9, and 10. That's a right turn. So out goes 9. If you want, you can check 10, 7, and 6. Uh, where is 7? I forgot already. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's 7. So 6, 7, and 10. So in fact, 7 also will go away. Right? So we've got 3, 6, 10, it seems, so far. Good? And then we will add 11, and we'll see that all of these will, will stay on the, on the convex hull. OK? So very simple strategy. Use a stack. The top three items on the stack, you check whether, hey, demo. Top three things, you check whether it forms a left turn. Anytime you remove something, once again, check the top three. Make sure they form a left turn. Everything must form a left turn. Because for a convex hull to happen, all of these are left turns. That is assuming you're going clockwise. If you went this way, everything would be a right turn. Is that clear? And the left turn test is something we discussed last time. Very simple. It's a simple uh, formula. Uh, once, you, once you look up the, the notes, you'll see that. Um, uh, fairly straightforward. You just multiply some x values and y values and check whether it's greater than zero and you're done. Right? What was the time complexity of lift? Did we do that? Of course. If there are three points, how much time do you expect to sp spend on it? How do you deal with um, three collinear points? Yeah, uh, good. That's a good question. So if you have three collinear points, in fact, here there were three collinear. Let's assume that these three are collinear. If they were collinear from, the, from, the, uh, uh, from this start point, it's possible that they are, they are not in the, uh, that they form distinct angles. 
if they form distinct angles, it's not a problem because they will get encountered in the right order and it'll, be, it'll get taken care of, obviously. Uh, uh, but the question really is, uh, is it considered a left turn or not? And the answer is that if it's, if it's a straight line, we'll keep, it, keep, the, keep all the points on the convex hull. You could skip the middle guy if you want to, uh, but typically convex hull, you just report everything that's on the, on the hull. Um, uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Either answers would be correct. Right? Other questions? All right, so what's the time complexity of this? It depends on the time complexity of, a, of the left turn test, which takes how much time? Constant. Constant, because there are only three points. There's nothing big to check over there. You're just going to do, multiply some numbers, subtract some numbers, and check whether it's greater than zero. That's a constant amount of work. And we saw that sorting everything takes n log n time. And then uh, we did all this stack work. Every item goes on the stack once and leaves the stack once. OK? Uh, and so the total amount of time you'll spend on the stack is linear. So all these left turn tests, there are only a constant, sorry, linear number of left turn tests that you will make. And so therefore, uh, after the sorting, it's just linear amount of work. Yeah, is that clear? So we're just testing local left turn test things, and that's all we need. And that's because for any convex hull, convex hulls look like that. And you'll see that at every point, it's a left turn if you're, if you're going this way, right? Here it's a left turn, here it's a left turn, here it's a left turn. So that's all you want. You want every turn to be a left turn. And if you do that, eventually you'll get back to the start point, And what you'll get is a convex hull, sorry, or at least a convex figure. That's all we want. And since we visited them in the order of increasing angles, uh, firstly, you're never going to miss any point. And if you throw something out, it's because it, it fell inside the convex hull. OK? That's the, this is called Graham scan. Now, uh, the time complexity was, so time complexity for Graham scan is, what did we say? N log n. Is that clear? And basically, the main cost is that of sorting these line segments. That was the main cost. Everything else is, is very, very efficient. Now, uh, yeah, yeah, so this is, that brings us to the, to the next algorithm. Oh, by the way, there is some nice app. You're welcome to go play with it and, and build convex hulls for yourself. So the main cost, of course, is sorting. And this brings us to the last one called, well, it's not the last one. There's one more. This is called Jarvis March, also called the package wrapping algorithm. We discussed this last time. Uh, again, we start with the point with the least y-coordinate and assume that we have a package paper that's along the x-axis. Since it's along the x-axis and this is the point with the least y-coordinate, all the points are on one side. So we're going to take this end of the rapid wrapping and move it up until we hit the first point. So this wrapping paper turns until it hits this side. When it hits this side, it also hits P1. And uh, it, 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 we, we have to figure out which point it hits first. And in this case, it'll turn out to be P1 because nothing else will come in the way. And then we continue to move the wrapping paper after it hits P1 until it hits another point. We'll call that P2. And along this way, there can't be any other points because if there was, it would, it would get hit by the wrapping paper. 
And so then we get to P2. We, we assume that the wrapping paper is long enough that we can now continue to wrap this. And we'll get P3. Then we'll keep doing this until we get P4. And finally, at some point, it has to come back to the start point. That's the algorithm. Now, there are some tricky aspects to this. Question is, how are we going to implement this, right? Algorithmically. So let's start with where we, where we, had at the, where we were at the beginning. We know P0 because that's the point with the least y-coordinate. That's easy to, easy to identify. Look at all the y-coordinates, pick the minimum, right? That's how much time? Linear time, right? Okay, good. So in linear time, we've identified this guy. Next job is to figure out P1. How much time am I going to need in order to figure out P1? Sorry? Linear. It's going to be linear because essentially I have to do what I did on the previous slide, right? I'm going to take all the, uh, come on. I'm going to, if this is my P0, I'm going to connect it to everything and I'm going to find the one with the smallest angle. And that's going to take me linear amount of time, right? because I have to find the angle that it has with the x-axis, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so in just to find P1 has taken me linear time. Then I have to find P2. How much time will that take? It's going to be linear again because maybe minus a little bit. We'll just ignore that, right? But essentially, now we're going to take P1 and connect it to everything and find the one with the least angle. But of course, our x-axis has now moved to, to that line, right? Is that clear? So we're going to spend order n linear time here, linear time there, linear time there, linear time there, and so on. So how much time will I spend for the whole algorithm? Sorry? N times <laughs> yeah, so it turns out that uh, in the worst case, of course, this is N squared. But in reality, we're going to write this as N times K, where K is number of points on the convex hull. What does this tell us? It tells us that if the number of points on the convex hull is very small, it's going to be very, very fast. It's going to be faster than the other algorithm. On the other hand, if you have a lot of points on the convex hull, this is a not a very good algorithm to, to use. The Graham scan is going to be better. Does that make sense? So there are, there are uh, what's the smallest number of sides that a convex hull can have? Three, right? It's possible that I have three points and I join them and everything goes inside there, right? It's possible. So number of sides, minimum number of sides that a, that a convex hull, in fact, minimum is really two because it's possible all of them sit on a straight line. Well, we'll ignore that degenerate case. It's possible that all of the points lie on very small number of, uh, uh, lies, on a tri lies within a triangle and in that case, this is going to be super, super fast. All right, because the whole thing just costs three times n. So uh, this, is this is the package wrapping algorithm and this is the Graham scan algorithm. Uh, and we don't know which one is going to be faster. Uh, 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 so it, we, we kind of have to decide which one we want. That brings us to to the last algorithm, which is the, uh, which most textbooks don't, don't really mention. Um, it turns out that there is a way to, uh, to, to uh, get the most efficient algorithm, regardless of whether k is small or not. Um, 
by the way, this algorithm is called a, an output sensitive algorithm or uh, because the time complexity depends on the size of the output. The size of the output is how many points you have on the convex hull. So that's why it's called output sensitive. Uh, it is possible, for those of you who are in my algorithms class, it's possible to prove that the lower bound on the time complexity is n log h, which is kind of crazy, where h, by the way, is, is k. Uh, I should have used h here. Uh, and that's a, that's a little bit harder to prove, but we won't, we won't go there for now. Um, so that brings us to a method that actually achieves this n log h. Uh, uh, but it's a little more complicated. Uh, I'm not sure if I have that here, but let me see what I have. The, the, remember that one of the first algorithms we looked at was the divide and conquer algorithm, where we said, take the set of points, chop it up into two, recursively sort convex hull on both sides, and then all you have to do is to find the two common tangents, and you can quickly put them together and build a larger convex hull, right? Uh, that's called, that's the divide and conquer method. It turns out that there is a conquer and divide method, which is strange, but it works really, really well, and it's actually a, a faster algorithm. In fact, it's, it runs in time n log h. And if you think about it, it's better than this and better than this. Okay, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, we thought this was fast enough when h is small, but you have something that's even faster. Now, how does this work? Do I have it here? I'm not sure, let me see. Yeah, there are also some randomized algorithms that run very, very fast. Uh, yeah. So let's, I, I, um, yeah, let's look at this algorithm, it's called Chan's algorithm, this Chan is, uh, his, his name is Timothy Chan, uh, used to be in, in Waterloo. Uh, so here is his plan, right? Yeah. Is, is this the algorithm that does component divide? I believe so, let me take a look. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, this one may not be actually. I think Chan's algorithm is also divide and conquer. There's one more algorithm which which is a bit complicated uh, that does conquer and divide. It's uh, maybe at some point uh, I'll, uh, I, I can explain it to you. Um, yeah, so in fact the conquer and divide uh, is, let me talk about that quickly. So divide and conquer, how does that work? It takes your set of points, right? That's my set of points. Then it says, find some vertical line where I, I'll get half and half, right? Uh, which can be sim easily figured out by taking all the x values and finding the median. And let's say roughly somewhere here is my halfway point. I have half the points on this side, half the points on this side. And I do the convex hull on this side and I'll get something like this. Maybe I use a different color. All right, how does this go? So, something like that, right? That'll be on the left side. On the right side, I'll have I'll get that, and then divide and conquer says find two common tangents, and in this case, the common tangents are probably going to be that and that, right? And then I simply remove this, 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 and this, because that's on the inside, and this, 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 and this, and this, and what's left is, is my convex hull. This is the divide and conquer approach. It turns out the conquer and divide approach starts by finding those guys very, very quickly. Okay, I, I won't get into that. That's actually the, the most interesting step, but it's more complicated. 
uh, it first draws this line, breaks it into two halves, and then finds this common tangent without actually drawing the polygons. And that's the, that's the whole trick. And then after that, it ignores all these guys and simply finds this half and that half uh, 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 more efficiently. And when you put all this together, you will see that you never pick up points, you never worry about points that are not on the convex hull. And you end up with n log h. Um, uh, uh, that analysis also is a little more complicated. Uh, but I wanted to tell you that trying some different bizarre approach can sometimes work uh, really, really well. Uh, here, this is very counterintuitive that finding these two convic the common tangent first, how could that possibly uh, help you uh, get more efficient algorithms? But it does. So let's go to chance algorithm and maybe we can spend time about on, on the other algorithm a little bit later. So chance algorithm is, is quite crazy actually uh, and does combine both Graham-Scan and Jarvis-March very effectively. But the first idea is you have a set of points. In our divide and conquer, we only broke it into two pieces. Here it says break it into even, even more pieces. In fact, break it into, into n over m uh, groups. And each group only has m points. Okay, So I have lots of uh, subsets. All right, And then we are going to use the Graham scan, which looks a little uh, uh, more complicated. And we're going to find the convex hull of each of the pieces. All right. Since each of the pieces only has m points, according to this, it's going to each convex hull, little convex hull is going to take me how much time? m log m, right? And I have to do this how many times? I have to do this n over m times. So that's what you'll see. Uh, so each one takes m log m time, and I have n over m such groups. Correct? So the whole thing takes me n log m. So far, so good. I haven't told you what m is, but let's keep that uh, open for now. Then I am going to take all the convex hulls, and I'm going to combine them into one big convex hull, but this time I'm going to use the other algorithm, the Jarvis March, the packing algorithm. Okay? So, how much time will that take me? Um, so for this, what I have to do is, for any pair of polygons, I have to find the common tangent. And since each of those pieces only has m, m points at most, that common tangent is a little faster now. And so it takes only log m time. And I can tell you more how that's log m a little bit later. For now, just uh, trust me on this. So between any two, any two convex polygons of size m, I'm going to find a common tangent very quickly in log m time. And then I'm going to put it all together. So instead of finding, remember in my Jarvis March, what did I do? I started with one point. I connected it to everything else and found the one with the least angle. This time, I'm not going to, I, I'm not dealing with single points, I'm dealing with convex hulls, right? And each convex hull had, uh, was a convex hull of m points. I'm going to take that whole convex hull and I'm going to find uh, common tangents to all the others and take the one with the least angle. How crazy is that? So uh, instead of finding the point with the least y-coordinate, I'll take the polygon that's furthest south. And then start from there. And instead of finding uh, straight lines to other points, I'm going to find common tangents to other polygons and pick the one with the smallest angle. OK? Yeah? How do you ensure that it's 
Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, that's a different question. So uh, ask me in a few minutes after I finished with the p big pieces. Okay. So, so therefore, uh, I can now find the, uh, the big convex hull. At the end, I'll be done with finding the big convex hull. All I have to tell you is how did I get the time complexity that I want. Is this somewhat clear? Um, so this is where it happens. I have, I have this many uh, convex hulls. Each one, uh, for, um, well, let's go back to Jarvis March. The Jarvis March, if I have n points, and if I have h points on the convex hull, it's going to take me n times h. Here I don't have n times h, here I have n over m times h. But finding these line segments is not constant anymore, but it takes me log m extra time every time I find the common tangent, so I have to multiply it by this log m factor. Is that clear? So all of this gives me n over m times h log m. This looks, this is beginning to look very, very nasty, but all of this becomes clear when you'll see that if I make this to be equal to this, okay, uh, uh, well, if I make, if I pick the m value properly, all of this becomes very, very nice. You'll see that in a minute. Um, so the total time complexity is the sum of these two things, right? Sum of this and that. So n, n log m plus n over, n over m times h log m. This is what we have. Now, the magic is in finding what that best value of m is that minimizes this. And, and you'll see that suddenly n log h jumps at you. Uh, so if we take m equals h, then this becomes n log h and this becomes h and h will cancel out and you'll get n log h. So the whole time complexity now becomes n, n log h, but I don't know what h is. All right, so this is again another brilliant step that Chan comes up with. Uh, since I don't know h, I'm gonna figure this out. <laughs> uh, and so he says, yeah, you can just simply search for h. All right, um, so, so try with h equals one, <laughs> try h equals two, h equals three, and so on. And then this gives you n h log h. Okay, so this is, the, if you just do linear search, that's what it's gonna take you. That's not so good, right? Because we, we got an extra h in there, which we don't like. Um, but we could also do binary search if we do binary search, then you get an extra log h factor there, and then you end up with n log squared h, which is also not so nice. And so he has one more idea, which is called doubling search, where you try h equals 1, h equals 2, h equals 4, 8, 16, and now magically all this, all this becomes n log h. So, oh, this also is n log squared h? Okay, maybe. Um, yeah, I forgot. So maybe, maybe he stopped it at n log squared h and then he had a new algorithm that ran in n log h. Uh, I had forgotten this, yeah. Uh, the log m. Yeah. Common tangent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, okay, let's draw some pictures. Um, yeah, can, can you, can I borrow your eraser, Ricky? Thank you. Okay. So what's fascinating is that nothing in Chan's algorithm is, is complicated, but he's put in so many little pieces together and made it work is just, just absolutely stunning. Uh, so uh, 
the general idea, as I said, is to first break down your endpoints into smaller polygons. Uh, so you will have one convex hull here, one convex hull here, one here, one here, right? So these are what your convex hulls look like, right? Here I made it somewhat simple, but you can, uh, uh, you, I'll, I'll introduce a little more complexity soon. Then, let's say you find the point with the smallest y-coordinate. So we know that that is this guy here, right? And so this is our polygon of interest, okay? What we're going to do is, we're going to find the common tangent to that polygon. That'll give me this. I'll find the common tangent to that guy here, which may not be to the same point. Common tangent to here. Common tangent to here. Okay, and I will pick the one with the least angle. And I know that, that that one will be the definitive one that'll stay in the convex hull, right? So I get my second point and all I have to do is to merge these two now. If you want, you can merge them, not a big deal. Uh, and then I'm going to start from here and <coughs> do my next round, right? So the next round finds co the common tangent here, 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 and here. Again, you can easily figure out which one will, will produce the smallest angle, uh, and you're gonna keep that. And then you take a part of that, and then you'll find a con common tangent from here to others, and so on. And so, instead of connecting points, you're doing entire polygons and moving around. That's the general idea. Now, I did simplify this picture. What did I simplify here? You made them circles? Uh, no, uh, well, uh, yeah, that is one, but that's not a major problem. I mean, I, I could easily have drawn it. Yeah. But there was one other uh, major simplification that I made in this picture that I should not, could not have made. You only use one tangent? Sorry? You only use one tangent? Uh, no, the one tangent is easy because I'll take, I'll take both those tangents and I, I know which one is, uh, is. Uh, which one is the, makes the smaller angle? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, not that, but also, I, 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 so I can keep both the, both the tangents and, and find the one that has all the points on one side. So it's, it's relatively easy to kind of figure that out. Uh, so the two tangents is not the big problem. There's one other simplification I made. Is it they are not coinciding with each other? You mean intersecting? intersecting. Good, yeah, so that's the, that's the thing. Here I drew them all to be separate, but there's no way for me to guarantee this because I'm randomly putting them into, into groups. So in reality, things are not as nice as this. They are actually looking, going to look very messy. So they're going to look, uh, one piece is going to look like this, another piece is going to look like this, another piece is going to look like this. I mean, uh, you know, you can draw polygons uh, and just drawing them as circles. But now, trying to find your common tangents looks a little, little more, uh, a little more work, a little more scary. Something can lie inside the other also. Sorry? It's possible that one lies completely inside the other. That's correct. Yeah, it's possible that one thing is, is inside here. Yeah. Um, so you have to take care of a few more cases when you find these common tangents. It's a little more work, so how but do you it's find the uh, well. If one contain is contained in the other, you don't have to worry about it. You can just throw it away. No, but in general, how, what's the algorithm? 
Uh, well, but before I find the common tangent, I'll check whether it's completely inside the other one, right? Yeah. So uh, then I don't even have to bother finding the common tangents. Yeah, I agree. I'm just asking you what's the algorithm. But in general, how, how to do this if, if one is contained in the other? No, no. If it's not contained also. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that. Sure. So let's say I have this one here and I have another one all right so here are two polygons and you want to know how to find uh, the the common tangents so so here is how this happens the first thing there there again there are many ways to do this here is one one simple way for me to to explain it to you find the one with the highest y coordinate and the lowest y coordinate okay this immediately chops up this polygon into two chains, the left chain and the right chain. I can do similar things over here. That's the one with the highest y coordinate. This is the one with the lowest y coordinate. So again, I get two chains here. I get two chains there. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, uh, yeah, from from this from this uh, point with the highest y coordinate. I am going to uh, uh, do binary search to figure out if there are uh, what is the tangent on this part of the of the chain and what is the tangent on this part of the chain if any okay uh, how does that happen well it's all they're all left turn tests this in fact with a left turn test you can do all the magic and the way that happens is that, uh, uh, so for instance, if I want to draw this, my common tangent is easy. It just, it just happens to be that because it'll be a right turn to every other point, right? And same thing over here, it's going to be, it's going to be that point. Everything else, uh, uh, all the other points are left turns from here, and from here, it's every other point is a right turn. So that's why it's a, uh, those are your common tangent points for just that part. When, then when you separately do it over here, you'll find a similar thing happening. Now I could complicate this for you and make this, or, or maybe you want, to, you want to see this happen. Uh, so let's say my picture looked like that. Okay, this is still a convex hull, right? In this case, uh, uh, I'm still going to get that point as my common tangent for, for that half. It's not guaranteed that that will be a common tangent. It no, be a tangent. It, it's not guaranteed at all, yeah. So, what will you Okay, so, uh, so think about it this way. For one point, I have, let's say I have a chain. I have a convex chain. Okay, the convex chain could be like that, right? Or it could be on the other side, it doesn't really matter. So what I'm going to do is, I am going to do a binary search. Again, assume that there are n, n pieces, n segments. I'm going to do binary search at the point of tangent. What, you, what should happen is the following. Uh, if let's say for this, the, let's say this is my, my tangent point, right? What you'll see is that uh, the, uh, if I think of this as A, if this as P, and this as, uh, let's say PI, and this is PI plus one, and this is PI minus one. What you'll see is that A to PI to PI plus one is, is, a, uh, is a right turn, and A to PI to PI minus one is a left turn. That's what you need to see. Sorry, uh, both of these should be left turns. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, my question is? Yeah. Oh, hold on, let, let me finish here. So uh, for any other point, if, if, you, if you draw this here, you'll find that uh, one is a right turn, one is a left turn. Okay, so at the point of common tangent, you'll find that both are, are, are a left turn. Uh, and if you go past that, if there is more here, right, then, uh, 
uh, again, that co the, the common tangent will will make it so that uh, so that a to pi plus one to pi is a right turn. A to pi um, a to pi plus one to pi plus two is a left turn. So so by using left turn tests, I can figure out where that common tangent is. And um, uh, how do you do this in binary search? Right. So uh, if you are if you are before this common tangent point, they will all they will both be. Uh, hmm. How does this work? If you think of it as being an order, you you want to just check one side, right? Yeah, well, binary search has to tell me which way to go. So I'm trying to figure this out. Mm. Mm -hmm. the, the, you can assume that the points in the convex cell are ordered, right? So if you're on one side. Like, right. Right, so you can assume that the points are ordered. In, in which case, if I if I test this, yes. I know that there are some points on this side and some points on this side. So therefore, I have to go further further yeah. south, right? Yeah. Uh, so that will help me to to narrow it down until I get to the right point. Uh, whereas if I go past this point, then what happens? If you go past that point, uh, the directions. But the previous and the next point will be will, will flip. Be, will, will flip. Will flip. Yeah. yeah. So, so the previous flip. point is on is on the wrong yeah, side. Always go towards the yeah. So so that's how you get binary search. You you have to decide whether you want to go this way or this way, and so the previous point. You're right. The previous point will tell you which way to go. But there's one problem here. Yeah. The algorithm that we have just now explained is for finding a tangent from a point, any point in the space, to a, a chain. polygon. But that doesn't guarantee you that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct. You're right. So, so what you do is the following: you find the so so you'll find the common tangent to here, and and you know eventually you'll figure out that it, it is this. Then you go on that side and do it from here, from here, from there. Okay. And if both of these agree that they are common they are common tangent points. Then that is your your right answer. But you're doing only you're doing that only for the topmost and the Correct. bottommost point, right? Correct. That's all you need. You need two, right? But you're not always guaranteed that those points will yeah. lie on the common tangent. Right? They are. That's what I'm trying to say. So the. Why don't you just hold on? Hold on. Build a line from those two. Points. Hold on. Let me explain to other people also. Okay. Just slow down. Um, uh, what I'm saying is the following. I'm saying that two points are the are the uh, uh, the line through these two points form the common tangent if if you do whatever i said described over there from this point it it gets you that point and when you do it from that point it gets you this point it will not happen in for other points so for instance if i uh, if uh, let's say for the sake of argument that this point had gone up right Yeah, this is possible, right? If uh, if this had happened, um, and if I had if I had chosen this to to test, when I did the search from here, it would have got me that point for sure, right? Because I haven't touched anything over there, it would have found me that point. So for each point, I'm finding the tangent partner. But then when I do it from here, it you, it will go through the search over here. It'll do the binary search, but it'll find out that this guy is the partner. So, so therefore, this guy is definitely not going to be on the common tangent. Now, it still doesn't mean that guy is going to be. I have to again do it from here, and and both have to agree that they are common tangent partners, and then you're done. Then, how, how do you ensure that it's a O of log n? You only have to do this. This is why I, I start with the with the point that has the largest y coordinate, and then once you do that, then uh, you will find that that there are only a constant number of things you have to search uh, around around them. 
yeah, yeah, that's one more trick there to, yeah, you're right. Did that make sense or was that, uh, please stop and ask me because he, he kind of went off on, on a, uh, did that make sense? So it, there is some version of binary search that helps you to find common tangents if, if they are nicely set up. Now, in order for binary search to happen, you need to have things in some increasing order or decreasing order. And that's why you break this up into two chains and do it separately and then merge them together. OK. All right, so did, do, do all the pieces come together now? So what we have here is Chan's algorithm where, well, the previous, uh, previous one had, the, had that description. Yeah, so you take your endpoints, you break it down into pieces of size M, you will get N over M such pieces for each one you use the Graham scan to find the convex hull. Uh, and then you put them together using the other algorithm. OK, which does package wrapping. And if the, if the M, the size of each of these pieces, is exactly the same as H, then the time complexity, according to the calculations, will be exactly n log h, which is the best possible, right? The only problem is we don't know h. And so we have to do some extra work to figure out what that value of h is. And there are several tricks. Those tricks, it turns out, does not help Chan to get the best possible algorithm. So he has a yet another algorithm that, that does that. I'd have to go and look it up. Uh, um, he has a randomized algorithm that, again, gets you to n log h, which is also quite nice. But I, I don't remember enough to, to describe it to you now. Sure. Uh, n log h is like average. n log h is not the average. n log h is the best possible. It's the lower bound according to the theory. No, for the chance algorithm, the randomized algorithm. Uh, it might be. Yeah, it might be. Uh, I'm not sure. Chance algorithm is not something you want to implement. It's quite complicated. Uh, finding, you just saw, finding uh, uh, common tangents uh, itself is expensive because you have to set it up in, in nice arrays and so on and so forth. And then you have to do binary search. And binary search is quite tricky. Uh, trying to implement all that is quite expensive. Um, not, it's not necessarily the best way to, to do so. Uh, what's the best? Uh, his randomized algorithm is actually very, very fast. So maybe at some point I'll, uh, I'll read up and, and explain that to you. Oh, oh, I do have a slide with more tricks. <laughs> yeah. So he says, what if m equals h squared? And if m is equal to h squared, then n log m is the same as n log h which is true, right? But in that case, I don't have to do this doubling search. I can do even, even better. I can go m, then m squared, and then square of that, and then square of that, and square. So it is going exponentially because you're squaring it every time. Oh, well, it's already going exponentially. Well, it's, yeah, it is, uh, it's going faster than exponential because doubling is exponential, right? This is actually squaring every time. It's not multiplying by two, it's multiplying by itself. So definitely faster than doubling, right? Doubling is exponential because you're doing two to the power of something every time, right? So here you're going two, four, 16, 256, et cetera. And this time the analysis works out and he proves that. Uh, you can look up, look this up. So it, here it says n to the power, n times two to the power t, because that power is two to the one, two to the two, two to the four, two to the eight, 
So the exponent is, is doubling, right? Right? If the exponent is doubling, then you're going Yeah, so n times m, uh, and, and m is 2 to the t, uh, and when you add that up, you get, uh, how did this come about? Yeah, so if you're, if you're doing this, the question is how many times will I do it? It turns out I will do it log log h times, and if I do it log log h times, and each time I'm spending this much time. <sighs> yeah, but uh, I understand the math, but I, uh, I'm not able to explain to you in, in some reasonable way. Uh, may, uh, maybe next time I'll, I'll look this up and, and explain it in a way that everyone understands. Uh, I don't see how you get just two to the t because I thought this was two to the two to the t t squared. No. Uh, yeah, you have a a will become a squared. Uh, then it will become a power four. That's not good enough. So something is not right. Uh, I'm not quite quite. Uh, I need to stare at this myself. Uh, this doesn't look right. Yeah. Anyways, uh, this, is, this is straight out of his paper, and essentially you get n log h. So he has, he has all these tricks that make it, make it n log h. Uh, um. uh, should it be uh, 2 to the power of 2 to the power of t? Yes, that's what, no, 2 to the, 2 to the t squared, not 2 to the 2 to the t. So this is 2 to the 1, yeah. this is 2 to the 2, this is 2 to the 4, this is 2 to the 8, so, oh. Is it 2t? No. Not 2t, it's like, it's doubling, t is doubling everything. But doubling yeah. on the, doubling if it's on doubling. Right? Doubling on the yeah, so. See, uh, so two that is 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 1, no? Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's what, it's 2 to the power of 2 to the power of t. 2 to the power, 2 to the power t. T. That's why there is log so t. So if that's 2 to the power, 2 to the power t, yeah. then this should also be 2 to the 2 to the t. That's why the summation is log log h. You have to take log That log part log. is clear, but then why, is, why isn't this 2 to the 2 to the t? Yeah, as I said, I, I have to. Uh, I I'd need a few few minutes by myself to to figure this out. But you guys are welcome to go and and mull over this. Can you say that? Like, uh, no. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I won't embarrass myself more by trying to figure this out online. Let me tell you about the other things that I already know. You can also do three D convex hulls. Three D convex hulls are much more difficult. It turns out. Uh, you can see what this convex hull looks like. Um, none of the tricks that we have with the Graham scan or Jarvis march is going to work. Why? Because I don't even know how to sort. Sorting doesn't make any sense in 3D. Okay. Uh, and if I'm if I'm going to apply some kind of a wrapping algorithm, I don't even know in what order to go. Okay. So it's completely nuts. Uh, 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 it turns out that there are very different techniques you need, and the time complexity is much higher. It's actually n squared here. Uh, so you don't get n log n or something like that. N you you want to get n squared is, yeah. But even to get n squared is not so easy. So it, it takes some work to kind of figure this out. All right, that brings us to an algorithm that somehow uses convex hull uh, in, in some strange way. How much time do I have? It's, uh, 49. Already time? Yeah. Okay, let me just quickly introduce the problem and then you, can, you guys can go and, and think about it. 
This is the problem. It's from Caddis. Uh, so you have you have a cake. Um, let me draw a cake. I'm going to draw a simple cake from above. And there are candles. And since this person is very old, there are lots of candles. And uh, the person needs to blow these candles out. Uh, and it turns out that the person who blows the candles uh, sends out a, a, a uh, the airflow goes in a uh, goes along a strip. And you want to know what's the minimum width strip needed to blow all the candles. So if he if he blew from here, then uh, it would it would be this width, right? That would be the width. If he blew from here, let me use a different color. Um, uh, actually, let me see. Let me try from here. If he blew from here, then then the width would be slightly less, would right? Be the longest distance between two points on the convex hole. Um, it's not. Um, but that's a good thought. Uh, I think you should play with this. Um, well, remember, here you want the direction w that minimizes this width. Whereas what you're suggesting, uh, well, uh, maybe you meant minimum distance between any pair of points on the, on the convex hull, but even that doesn't work. Um, so anyways, uh, you have to find the direction that will capture all the candles and blow them, but with minimum width. And we'll talk about this next time.